Two quick things to get out of the way first. Number one, this is not a joke. I'm a big Lord of the Rings fan, and ever since this game was announced back in 2019, I've been morbidly fascinated by it. Number two, it's an atrocious game that should not have been released in its current state, let alone for $60, with features like the lore compendium and the Sindarin voiceovers only being included in the Precious Edition for an additional $10. So while I don't want this to be yet another video that just makes fun of this ridiculous game, I do think that criticism is deserved, and that Daedalic Entertainment waived the right to the benefit of the doubt by pricing this game and its extra features the way that they did. I want to take a somewhat serious look at what Gollum's story ended up being, and in what I hope is a more interesting examination, what I think it was trying to be. To my dismay, this was not a good bad that you might expect from a Hallmark Christmas movie. Unfortunately, Gollum does not come back to his hometown and bump into his old flame from high school who is now a widow with a precocious child that latches onto Gollum as a surrogate father. There's no baking competition, no obtuse and chaste flirting, nobody walking around an idyllic town with cute scarves and generic coffee cups. Instead, we have a bloated and miserable first and second act that make the final one seem almost tolerable by comparison. I think, in the most generous reading of the game, we would say that Gollum is trying to examine the miserable cycles of its titular character. Act 1 establishes his wretchedness and sees him suffer in prison, but doesn't really set up that much in the way of the plot or Gollum's character. In Act 2, we see a classic Gollum cycle play out before our eyes, as Gollum once again sacrifices a friend in his pursuit of the ring. In the final act, it's Gollum's choices that will free or doom a similar soul, but no matter what happens, he's still too closely bound to the ring to ever be free himself. It has tragic elements, obviously, but it's not structured like a tragedy, nor does it seem to lean too heavily on our awareness of Gollum's ultimate fate. Instead, it's structured like a modern action story, featuring the world's dullest anti-hero, right down to the light-related MacGuffin and apocalypse-halting climax. It's very weird. So let's take a look at a game that has nothing interesting to say about Gollum and misunderstands significant parts of the world he plagues. I'm going to be including most of the story details so that you'll have a similar amount of the information that I do, so if you have your own theories or make a connection to the game or the broader lore that I missed, let me know. I'm guessing and hoping most of you haven't played this, so my recap to analysis ratio is skewed much more heavily towards the recap side than I usually prefer. That's a balance I think about a lot in my other videos, but not only is Gollum just nuts, but there's also not a lot to analyze until we get towards the end. I still find it compelling in the car crash kind of way, and I'm hoping at least a few of you do too. And with that, let our wretched odyssey begin. Sickos only beyond this point. Sickos and or people who have started other games, meals, or sleep routines and are too lazy to find something else. I appreciate you too. Before we jump into the start of the game, I think we have to acknowledge how controversial it is that this game exists at all. When this game was announced, a lot of people were understandably skeptical. It's a video game starring Gollum. That's obviously weird. But I want to briefly defend its existence before I vivisect its execution. I think any idea, if executed with creativity and vision, can give rise to a compelling story. I remember rolling my eyes at the existence of the Andor TV show, like Gollum we knew his fate, like Gollum we knew where we'd have to leave things at the end of this story for the next journey to keep going, but unlike Gollum, Andor gets creative and explores a new dimension of its world and it gives us some of the best Star Wars we've ever gotten, albeit on a small scale. So I'm not inherently opposed to a Gollum game, though I am a bit perplexed by this one. There are some 4-5 or five minute company funded making of clips that are posted on various YouTube channels, and in one, one of the game's writers says, Before we started with the, with the writing process, we did of course a lot of research. We read the books, we watched the movies and read Tolkien's notes that he left about the story and about his writing process and his letters and all we could get our hands on basically. He later mentions working with the Tolkien expert. And what's interesting to me is that if they really did all this research, they certainly would have come across this passage from one of Tolkien's letters. Part of the attraction of The Lord of the Rings is, I think, due to the glimpses of a large history in the background. 
an attraction like that of viewing far off an unvisited island or seeing the towers of a distant city gleaming in a sunlit mist. To go there is to destroy the magic unless new, unattainable vistas are again revealed. And then I'm jumping ahead a bit in his letter. There are, of course, quite a lot of links between The Hobbit and The Lord of the Rings that are not clearly set out. They were mostly written or sketched out, but cut out to lighten the boat, such as Gandalf's exploratory journeys, his relations with Aragorn and Gondor, all the movements of Gollum until he took refuge in Moria, and so on. And that's from letter 247, if anyone's curious. So here is Tolkien himself explaining his hesitance around the needless filling of gaps, literally calls it destroying the magic, quote, unless new, unattainable vistas are again revealed. A few lines later, he specifically cites the untold journey of Gollum as something he removed to lighten the boat. If they really did their research, this would have been one of the first things they found. I'm not kidding when I say that it took me about two minutes to find this after I decided to go looking for Tolkien's references to Gollum across his preserved letters. So the folks at Daedalic stumbled across this and decided that Gollum's story needed to be told anyway. Perhaps their expansion of Gollum's journey would reveal some new, unattainable vistas. Perhaps they would leave their mark on one of the most ambitious and influential fantasy epics in existence. Tolkien thought that this was a story that was more interesting if left untold. Daedalic thought otherwise, so what was their grand idea? What stroke of narrative genius warranted ignoring the wishes and advice of a universe's creator and justified the creation of this game? I don't know, because after spending over 12 hours playing it, I have no idea what Gollum is doing. What little it does attempt was done better and more efficiently within the pages of The Lord of the Rings. Gollum doesn't just confirm Tolkien's worst fears and destroy the magic. It's so dull that it tries to take your will to live with it and will frequently crash to join you down in the emotional rubble. In that video I referenced earlier, they call this a narrative-driven game. They tout their studio's history of narrative games. And, uh... I suppose we can call it a narrative-driven game because the only other thing that drives you to play Gollum is masochism. And I don't think you want to put that on the box art. Gollum is split into 10 chapters. I believe they do this to try to mimic the structure of the Lord of the Rings novels, which are split into two parts of around 10 chapters each. Half of them have exactly 10 chapters, the shortest has 9, the longest 12. I say this is to mimic the novels because nothing in the story warrants this being split into 10 chapters, as you'll probably be able to tell as we slog through them. Chapter 1 lasts about 15 minutes, chapter 2 and 3 would be improved if they were a fraction as long and slapped together. Chapter 6 is basically just Shelob's lair. I really do think that they were trying to hit that 10 chapter mark, and I have a horrible theory as to why. I think this was originally supposed to be a part 1, and that a Gollum part 2 would show us Gollum's adventures in Moria and tracking the Fellowship. That could also explain why so many of the other subplots in this game go unexplored or unresolved. We do have confirmation that Daedalic cancelled another Lord of the Rings game that was in development. I don't think it was a direct Gollum sequel though. According to some Polygon reporting, the internal codename was It's Magic and was going to tell, quote, a story from a character's perspective that has never been told before. So were there plans for a more traditional Gollum sequel in addition to that game? I don't know. And thankfully it seems like they won't make any more of these, so I guess we'll never know. Gollum drops us in on our titular character in a prison cell in Mirkwood, with Gollum mumbling a riddle to himself while staring at some flowers he scratched into the wall. Without me, eyes are marbles. No darkness they see. Faces look garbled. No flurry they feel. No breath. No cheer. Death not to fear. Time is not spent. Loses has no scent. At nothing you can marvel without me. Smeagol knows it's not lilies nor roses, and this is one of the through lines of this game that I actually think is pretty creative. In Chapter 2 of Fellowship of the Ring, when Gandalf is filling Frodo in on the Ring's dark history, he describes Smeagol's discovery of the Ring like this. On a time they took a boat and went down to the gladden fields, where there were great beds of iris and flowering reeds. There Smeagol got out and went nosing about the banks, but Deagle sat in the boat and fished. 
And we know the rest, though Gollum will address it as well. But I actually like that they've pulled this once insignificant detail about this bed of iris flowers and turned it into a symbol of Smeagol's innocence. This was the last moment of normalcy in his life. This was the last time he was ever untainted by the ring's darkness and his own evil deed. It's understandable that this idyllic flower would haunt the corners of his mind, this bright spot from his last normal day. The Elf King tells Gandalf that they believe Gollum was in Mordor, and as Gandalf begins his interrogation, we flash back to 3012 of the Third Age in the mountains of Cirith Ungol. I don't think the canon timeline of the Lord of the Rings gives us a firm year of Gollum's capture in Mordor. In Appendix B in Return of the King, the only information we have is that between 3009 and 3017, quote, at some point during these years, Gollum himself ventured into Mordor and was captured by Sauron. In 3017, the timeline says that, quote, Gollum is released from Mordor. He is taken by Aragorn in the Dead Marshes and brought to Thranduil in Mirkwood. He then escapes when Mirkwood is attacked by orcs in June of 3018, and we know that he escapes to Moria, where he will later encounter the Fellowship in January of 3019. So the first part of that journey, this unknown time in Mordor, was left open to their interpretation, something that they mention in these making of videos. So we had to fill in the gaps and uh, really uh, try to interpret those notes and integrate them into our story and make sure that we are in line with what Tolkien wrote, but still at our own version. And that's a creative challenge, obviously. That's about eight years of Gollum being around Mordor that are unaccounted for. So they've chosen for him to be captured in 3012, and then for him to be immediately thrown into the slave pits, which means Gollum will have to be there for years which means we'll eventually be treated to one of the most absurd time jumps I've ever experienced in a video game. The first challenge players must overcome is attempting to coax a stable frame rate out of the game. My PC is fine. I bought it years ago, mostly to play Mountain Blade Bannerlord. It's not fancy, but it's similar-ish in power to current gen consoles and can run what should theoretically be more demanding games at 60 plus frames. And I had to turn everything down to low, including, tragically, Gollum's hair physics simulation. And even then it was struggling to run, so a few minutes into the first mission, I had to lower the game's resolution down to 1080. And despite those efforts, 30 FPS felt like a rare luxury. So apologies for the visuals, this isn't the graphical feast you were expecting from the game, but it's the best I could do. We're given a climbing tutorial as Gollum works his way through the storm back to his cave. Inside the cave there are more drawings carved into the rocks, and I think this is an original concept from Daedalic. I can't find any references to drawings in Gollum's lair in The Hobbit, but I like their inclusion because we're experiencing a Smeagol that's ever so slightly beginning to recover from possessing the ring. The flowers in his cell, the sketches of an old home, they're effective external symbols of the Smeagol half gaining slightly more control. In this cave, that's balanced out by the bones, and an impromptu shrine to Shelob, which feels like the external manifestations of the Gollum half. The dark bird from the game's opening cinematic is watching Gollum in the cave, and when Gollum notices, he tries to hunt it down. A decidedly unmerry chase ensues, and it ends with Gollum high up in the mountains, gazing out over Mordor. Gollum then sees a very distinctive looking bug and starts to follow it. He finds a small patch of white flowers in a rare Mordor sunbeam and briefly stops, awestruck and confused, when the beetle returns to land on his hand. This prompts the first Gollum Smeagol debate, whether to kill the beetle, but I want to talk about two things first. The beetle is very distinctive looking and unlike the dirty black bird, seems more benevolent. The way that the camera tracks it is kind of unusual too, and I wonder if this is supposed to be one of Gandalf's messengers, which I believe is a movie-only creation. Its curved, distinctive shell is very reminiscent of this game's version of Gandalf, and even with the fuzzy timeline, this would still be around the time Gandalf and Aragorn are trying to track down Gollum to learn more about Bilbo's ring. At multiple points, Gollum the game tries to show how Mordor and the Elves and Men of the West all appear to be equally a threat to Gollum, even though we, the player, obviously have a preference, and I wonder if this is supposed to be a part of that. He's pursued by spies from every faction. This is also a game, and I suppose a universe, that's obsessed with dualities. Capital G good and capital E evil, Smeagol and Gollum, Sauron bird and possible Gandalf bug, and then white flowers and a dark tower, 
I can't say for sure what these flowers are, but they do look like they could be white iris flowers. And we've already been primed to kind of look at those as a symbol of Smeagol and Smeagol's innocence, or lost innocence, I guess. Later in the game, when Smeagol encounters iris flowers with a new friend, they prompt a moment of almost revelation, but there in that moment, I think they're orange iris flowers, which is a little strange since the white ones are given this lengthy moment here, but it's far from the weirdest decision this game makes. With the flower and the beetle covered, we get to our first Smeagol Gollum debate. These moments look weird, and they're just so frustrating and uncompelling in pretty much every way. In every situation, you are able to choose which side you want. You can easily win every argument. There is no tension, no fear of what the other half might want, because it's so easy for the player to overrule it. We have total control over the actions of Smeagol slash Gollum, and in giving us that, it removes us from Smeagol's tormented state entirely. If you're going to make a game about this character, I feel like this was the least interesting interpretation of the gollum smeagol dichotomy one could go with. It comes off like such an easy symbiotic relationship here and down the line. Smeagol just hangs out and does his thing, and when he's challenged by something or needs some extra motivation, Gollum jumps in and takes over for a bit. Looks like a frog! Don't listen, my love! Smeagol is not so much haunted by Gollum as he is protected by him. It's not necessarily inaccurate, there's a reading of Gollum's character that would work like this, I just think it's the least interesting one in a game that desperately needs more interesting elements. Smeagol won the debate, so the beetle got to live long enough to see Smeagol flee into a nearby mineshaft to escape a patrolling Nazgul. I actually kind of like how this Nazgul hunt handles from a gameplay perspective. Gollum can run around the mine trying to find a way out, but he starts to notice more and more Nazgul creeping forward from pretty much every direction. It's the only time in the game when I think creeping dread is intended and achieved, and my luck eventually ran out when I was testing whether or not I could throw a rock at the Nazgul. So Gollum is captured, and the next scene flashes between his two interrogations, one from the Nazgul in the past and one from Gandalf in the present. Some of the direction in cutscenes is actually pretty good, but it's funny because actual cutscenes usually last like 7 or 8 seconds, so they don't usually last long enough to be appreciated. They're also weirdly obsessed with these heroic shots of Gollum performing these action hero dives, and I'll point some of those out as we go. But here, the quick jump from Gandalf's pointing staff to the Nazgul's pointed blade is thoughtfully done. We can see how Gollum is viewing these two events as similar experiences, even though to the player's mind, we think of Gandalf as a good guy, and this interrogation as the good one. I also found it strange that it was Gollum that was telling Smeagol. Don't tell them, precious! And then it's Smeagol that gives up Bilbo's name in the Shire. Wouldn't the Gollum half be trying to get out of there as fast as possible, and also be hoping to follow Sauron's servants in their search for the ring? It's presumably the Gollum half that brings them to Mordor for this reason, so Gollum's determined silence and Smeagol's panicked breaking just feels misaligned. Before chapter 2 begins, we get a loading screen, and something baffling this game does is that it puts important story information in the small loading screen text. So here we have, after being questioned by the Dark Lord himself, Gollum was thrown into the slave pits underneath the Dark Tower. Oh, Gollum was questioned by the Dark Lord himself? Yeah, I definitely wouldn't want to show that. We just saw the Nazgul talking to him. We didn't even see the mouth of Sauron who comes up later in this game, let alone some version of Sauron himself. This is just a weird and jarring way to start the second chapter. But start the second chapter we regrettably do, as Gollum is cast into the slave pits of Mordor. Gollum goes to sleep, and the next day, his life as a slave begins. He's assigned to work with beasts, and on the way down, Smeagol says, But we told him! Smeagol will find it! We swears! So here we're referencing that conversation that we only just learned about from the loading screen. There seems to have been some kind of deal or understanding reached between Sauron and Gollum about his survival. But it can't have been, aid me in the search for the ring and I'll let you live. Otherwise, why would Gollum spend years in Mordor doing menial labor? It might be indifference. Maybe Sauron doesn't care about Gollum and just figured he'd enslave him for as long as he could. Or maybe this is a kind of test, and he figures that if Gollum is going to be worth anything in a search for the ring, the first hurdle he'll have to overcome is escaping Mordor. We don't know, and the game doesn't seem to care after this. Characters we'll meet later will question why Gollum was spared by the Dark Lord, but the game never resolves that mystery. 
Speaking of mysteries the game doesn't care about resolving, Gollum's fellow prisoners will mockingly refer to the frail man as king, and later in this chapter, he tells Gollum that he was a king of men somewhere. I didn't pay more for the terrible lore compendium, so I looked him up on one of the fandom wikis, and there's no indication that I've missed some conversation or clue. We just know he was once a great king, at some point he was taken, and in a few years, he'll die here. Hey Grashnik, I didn't catch your name. Smeagol. Smeagol. You're going to die down here, Smeagol. My advice, make your death count. You have to get the Borrocks back into the pens. That's the most important line in this first act for obvious reasons. And whatever small gravity it had was eradicated by that early trigger about the menial task ahead of us. You're going to die down here, Smeagol. My advice, make your death count. There's the obvious dramatic irony. Smeagol, of course, is going to die in Mordor, and his death will count more than any other. But this idea of one's death mattering kind of becomes the, I don't want to say heart of this first act, because as we'll go on to show, it's a heartless mess. But I think that's what it's trying to do. These doomed men and orcs, all they have left is their death. And rather than let that foster despair, this forgotten king is urging them to make it count, to try to give their death a purpose. Smeagol works with the frail man to trap the beasts before he's moved to a shift in the mines. His mission in the mines is just grabbing the tags of dead slaves, which in another context might be shocking, like, oh my goodness, they value this piece of metal more than the bodies of the fallen workers. But this is Mordor, so obviously they do that. That's kind of all we were expecting. And if this is just supposed to be an authentic glimpse into Gollum's miserable experience as a prisoner, they don't actually commit to that either, because these tedious missions are so short and we don't have time skips during the day. Gollum tames beasts for 5 minutes, retrieves tags for about 10 or 15 minutes, and then returns to his cell. So it's in this awkward middle ground where, yes, these jobs are horrible and boring and make for a terrible video game, and they're theoretically making us live through Gollum's wretched life as a prisoner to bring us closer to him and his desire to escape. But also, these horrible jobs take about 15 minutes a day, and then he's back to his cell because they don't bother to make it appear as though more time is passing. And I don't want to sound like an obsequious bootlicker, but 15 minutes of work for bread and lodging is... You know, not as horrendous and vile a situation as I think the Mordor slave pits is supposed to be. Before Gollum's first day ends, we see a line of prisoners being either sent back to their cells or put in a cage and sent up to the tower. A fellow prisoner says that they send the weak ones up there, though we don't yet know why. I want to show you the conversation that happens in the cell at the end of the second night, because there's a few weird things in here. Take Darimon's corner, at the window. He doesn't need it anymore. Why do they call it king, this one? Is it a king? Yes, is it? Mm, here we go. That boring story again. Sephard, the sand flood king, blah, blah, blah. Stupid name for a stupid king. Did he rule beautiful white cities? He barely rules his own bones. He's a useless millstone chained to my foot. Nick. What did you say? Never mind. They tell Gollum to take the sick man's corner at the window, but one, it's not a corner, and two, we already spent a night at the window last night when he was dropped in here. So this dialogue that implies this is Gollum's first night, combined with the janky info dump about Sauron's interrogation and the loading screen, makes me think that everything we've just played was not originally supposed to be part of the game. There's also the comment about how the frail man is chained to the orc's neck, not his foot, but as you can see, there's no chains in here. That observation isn't really relevant, it's just some classic Gollum jank. The writing in Gollum isn't great, obviously, but it's also unsupported by the gameplay and visuals in this moment and others down the line. Characters referencing things that aren't there or that just make no sense. The narrative is the main thing that I'm focusing on, but Gollum is obviously a failure at pretty much every level. In that making of video I showed earlier, one of the b-roll shots is just one of the writers tapping on keys before we cut to a shot of a blank word document. Well, okay, that's unfortunate, but mistakes happen. Not the best optics from a visual perspective, but what can you do? Oh, maybe don't embarrass the guy again by showing us that his prop notes on Lord of the Rings is just writing in huge letters, synopsis, L-O-T-R by J-R-R-T, and then like two illegible words on a medium-sized note card. 
Some internal or external video team came in to make these. Presumably their job is to make the developers look good, build excitement for the game. But at multiple points there are these staged shots that make the people who worked really hard on this game look ridiculous. If you're making these videos, you're supposed to be sweating the details. It's either incompetence from the video team or a galaxy-brained scheme to try to pin Gollum's failure on a few bungling devs, rather than an entire company and publisher that supported this idea from conception to release. That's important to note for me because of how much of this critique is negative. This team worked really hard on this, and they weren't set up for success at all. Because yes, you can still work hard on projects that should probably have never been made in the first place. Exhibit A. The budget for Gollum was reported to be about 15.9 million, which is, according to people who know things about game development because I don't, nowhere close to what you need for a AAA game, which is how Gollum was being marketed. There's also reporting out there that trailers were released without the dev team's knowledge, which could explain the insane quality gap. And the German publication Game 2 reported that Daedalic had a culture of poor pay, crunching, and a toxic work environment, with an anonymous source saying there was an atmosphere of fear. A lot of that reporting was backed up by IGN, whose article I'll link in the description. So we'll get back to Gollum, and it's really just going to get worse from here until we reach Mirkwood. But it's very obvious that this incompetent mess is not the end product that anybody wanted. Someone decided to still release it when they did, and release it for $60, so it deserves most of the criticism it gets, but I do feel bad for the team behind this cursed game. As Gollum settles in, he surveys the tower and the gate out of the black pits. That beautiful gate leads straight out of Lugborz, they say. There it is, opening to the chime of a bell. A cunning invitation. Huh? Huh? Who lives in the tower? The master of the Black Pits, a sorcerer. But the orcs just call him Candleman. Candleman? Maybe they think it's him whose light burns in the tower. Alas, there is only one way into the Tower of Light. The one that our sick friend Darimon took today. The frail man explains that the sick prisoner had been obsessed with finding plans for the tower, and promises to show Gollum where he would need to go to find them. That becomes Gollum's next quest. But after this section, I started to wonder whether or not Gollum was purposefully trying to emulate the Count of Monte Cristo. I know. This is ridiculous. I told you sickos only. I tried to warn you. The wise old prisoner taking the new kid under their wing is a fairly well-known trope, but in this case, the similarities are interesting enough that I think it warrants a direct comparison. I'm going to talk about the first half-ish of that book, so if it's on your holiday reading list and you don't want it spoiled, just jump ahead about 30 seconds. Smeagol, like Edmond Dantes, and I can't believe I just started a sentence with those words, is wrongfully imprisoned. The prison is notoriously inescapable. The only way out appears to be death. Both Smeagol and Dante's encounter a wise old man with whom they conspire to escape. I don't know if we're supposed to see the frail king as a mentor figure for showing Smeagol how to tame beasts, work in the mines, giving him life lessons on death, but to some extent both Smeagol and Dante's learn broader lessons from their wise fellow prisoner. Smeagol has a dual identity before prison, Dante's creates one after escaping. Both are seeking escape to get revenge and recover the life that they believe was stolen from them. I thought, especially with how frail we see this old man, that we were possibly being set up for a similar escape, in which Smeagol takes the place of the old man somehow after he dies, and escapes through the Tower of Light. While his escape does ultimately end up using the tower, it doesn't really involve the frail king at all after this point. Sorry, I realized while editing this that I don't really have a satisfying conclusion for this part. Normally when I'm referencing another text, it's for a more concrete reason than these two things are weirdly similar. Here there's not really another reason, to be honest, because I just don't think Gollum is trying to tell a story with similar motifs. But that's also because I don't really understand what story Gollum is telling at all. So there's some weird similarities, it's possibly and probably irrelevant, but since we're doing this stupid video anyway, I might as well mention it. It's also, okay, this isn't relevant, but I figured this out and now you must be cursed with it too. The king's name, Sefut, is also an anagram for the word fetus. You didn't want or need to know that, I'm just trying to turn over every narrative stone and see if we can find cool bugs under them. You've lost your mind. 
You've lost your goddamn mind, Charlie! The next day, Gollum is sent to the mines to set off some charges. On the way down, we hear from the frail king that they used to have the dwarves do this, but with all of them dead, they send the most starved slaves, labeled dirt eaters. Which is an okay attempt at world building, there are a lot of moments like this where Gollum is showing you how much the writers cared and took this world seriously, and that's part of what I find so compelling about this game. It's not a passionless mess. If you look, you can find moments of care and craft, but they're just so easily overshadowed by the massive structural issues and the ceaseless mediocrity of its gameplay and optimization. What's that? I smell incompetent. Speaking of this orc, Gollum reports to him after his work in the mines, and he says, And now he wants bread for crawling through some dirt. Take it then. Nobody shall call Kushnach unjust. I'm sorry, what? This orcish mine foreman is concerned about being labeled unjust? Where in Tolkien's entire legendarium does an orc ever talk like that? Justice is not exactly a concept with which they trouble themselves. Immediately after that weird conversation, literally we just fade to black and open on a different scene, the old king tells Gollum a secret. Remember the dwarves I mentioned earlier? One of them told me something once. Those buildings up there, above the bridge, see? He had to build them. Dangerous work. But after a while, he knew where the guards watched. He'd steal red stones and hide them in a cave near the bridge. Just one stone each day, so the guards wouldn't notice. Why? Why do you think? What happened? Well, one day he slipped and fell. Gollum says it's not a very nice story, and I guess this is another part of this axe give your death meaning through line. The dwarf attempted an act of rebellion, but his death was still meaningless. He fell, and now he's been forgotten by almost everyone but this frail old man. After this, the cruel orc, Gollum's other cellmate, tries to take his bread, and we get this iconic scene that many of you will recognize from the review discourse. I thought it would be funny to threaten him, and it went about as well as you'd expect. Perhaps Oak would sleep more quiet if we was his friend. Is that a threat? Are you threatening me? Then we hit a loading screen before text appears on a black screen informing us that days have passed. Gollum is apparently hoping to find the maps that the frail man mentioned back on a second night, and the man promises to show him a way to get into the Hall of Grand to find them. About 45 minutes of horrible platforming later, Gollum makes it up to the tower and looks at the plans, which… Okay, we don't know this yet, but everything in red, the big bird, the water, and the cart and driver on the bridge are essentially all the elements that will be necessary for Gollum's escape. But why are they already highlighted in this weird, cartoony style on a map that's not intended for highlighting escape routes? It's another possible oversight in a game with countless of them, and it's partly why I was so confused while playing this. It's hard to tell what's a piece of the larger puzzle and what's just bad design. At this point, one of my main theories was that Sauron had put Gollum down here to test him, and that if Gollum could escape the prison, then he was worthy enough to officially join the Nazgul in their hunt for the ring. So I thought this could have been placed there on purpose, but the further into the story we get, the less I think that could conceivably be the case, I think it's just a weird oversight. Gollum takes the map in an action they don't even bother to animate, and on the way back to his cell, he's caught by orcs. As punishment, he's sent down to collect slave tags from the fiery lakes. After he finds the tags, we get this, um, moment of cinema. Get up and drink. You're parched. So, obviously Gollum's awkward fainting looks absurd, but I actually think the fade from the Sauron dream or flashback to the wake-up call from the frail king is a nice wrinkle. 
We don't know if that was Gollum remembering a conversation with Sauron or just having a nightmare influenced by the frail king trying to wake him. While I'd like that moment better as a dream, we do know that Smeagol did have some conversation with Sauron, during which he promised he'd try to recover the ring. Which, again, if that was the case, why is Smeagol here? If Sauron thinks Gollum is useful in any way, and since he made Gollum promise him he'd help find the ring, we have to assume he does, why is he risking Gollum's demise by subjecting him to endless torment in the pits of despair? I can only assume we're supposed to think this is a test. This is why I don't think I'll label this video a narrative critique, because I just… I don't know what I'd be critiquing for these first two parts, to be honest. The majority of our time and energy is much more focused on determining what is happening and why, rather than asking ourselves how or why it's effective. With Gollum awake, the frail king makes his pitch. Fight, or keep eating dirt. It's your choice. But we are going. Creaking bridge! Just listen, just climb up. Up, as high as you can. There's a storage room with many barrels. One of them should have a black mark. Up to the creaking bridge. He's nothing but skin and bones. He can't do it. He can. You can do this. You know the drill. Take a stone, put it in the barrel, run. Get up. Let's show those vermin who I am. So, I think the cave we're in now is the one that the frail man was talking about earlier. The one where the rebellious dwarf was hiding red stones to use against the orcs. I don't know that for sure, and it's weird that the game doesn't draw your attention to that idea more explicitly because it would have made this moment more impactful. Through our efforts, we're giving a small rebellion and his unceremonious death meaning. After the climb, Gollum plants the stones, and we transition into a cinematic that made me audibly scoff when I first saw it. A dark bird, similar to the one that we saw in the introduction, sees this happen and flies away, presumably to notify his masters. I thought we were then going to play through an attempted escape sequence. We're frequently told and shown how sneaky and acrobatic Gollum is. So even though he's been detected, surely he's going to attempt to escape in the chaos. Uh, no. We're not even going to show his capture. Instead, the game fades to black and we open on a scene, the next morning, with a line of prisoners being interrogated. Gollum is questioned by a woman, and has the chance to blame either the frail man or the cruel orc, the one who stole our bread. The frail man is the Gollum option, and the Smeagol option is to blame the cruel orc. Smeagol's instinct is to protect his friend, and Gollum's is to be honest since it's the simplest way to save his own skin. I blamed the cruel orc. He stole our bread. Not very nice. The woman tries to send Gollum and the cruel orc up together. No! She promised to let Smeagol live! No, I promised you'd be free. Wow, chilling villain work. His fiery demise is deferred when an orc lets her know that Gollum is on the list of creatures not to be touched. Back in the cell, the frail man is suspicious about why Gollum was spared, but not before he points out that the only way to escape the tower is swimming through water, which again, a little count of Monte Cristo. But it appears they won't even let you into the execution chamber, which makes me wonder why. Smeagol's not a squealer. And yet, here he is, alive, and robbed me of my most glorious end. This reaction irritated me so much that I let the golem half win, and I blackmailed the king. His bread for our silence. This moment is the reason I kept circling back to the make your death count exchange, because from this conversation here, it appears the king is furious we've deprived him of his martyrdom. And that's a really interesting conflict, but not when Gollum is on the other half or two thirds of the conversation. Because, my sweet king fetus, you want a most glorious end, you want opportunities for martyrdom, close your eyes and point at something. You have access to a cave of explosive stones. You had every opportunity to speak up and proudly claim credit when Gollum was being interrogated. You could probably push any number of orcs off of a ledge or into the magma. I think this is supposed to be a complex moment, the wrinkle in the make your death count arc, but it just falls so flat because the king comes across as more of a coward than a freedom fighter unjustly deprived of a glorious end. But of course, Gollum can't have that conversation because he's just incapable of that level of cognition or rhetoric. 
Which, again, yes, makes him an insane protagonist for a game in general, but especially for a game that wants to tell a story that's trying to be this complex. If this game had to exist, I don't know why Inside But Gollum or Gollum in the Dark Forest wasn't the elevator pitch. I'm so curious who at Daedalic or their publisher heard, okay, so the first half is like a prison simulation in Mordor, and the first act we're gonna have this weird moral through line that Gollum won't even understand or engage with, and in the second act, Gollum is gonna be this hardened prisoner who knows all the ropes before escaping, and wait, this is where it gets really good, he's captured again. By Aragorn, but don't worry, we'll skip that whole bit, and now he's a prisoner in Mirkwood, and then when he escapes and is free to wander Middle Earth again, game over, brother. If you pitched that idea at 99% of game studios, they'd probably ask you to pee in a cup. Your love of the halfling's leaf has clearly slowed your mind. After this conversation with the moping king, we get more important information in the loading screen. Gollum had been spared. Why? The question was haunting him. But not only him. Don't we know why Gollum has been spared? Hasn't he referenced a promise made to Sauron multiple times? We can probably put our red yarn away. I have a hunch I know who was behind this. The next morning, Gollum's back to work and goes down to the plaza to get his marching orders. See? It's simple maths. Tell your father we will double our efforts. Long story short, you need to triple your efforts. I think this is supposed to be funny, and it probably would have been were it not for this strange and awkward pause right in the middle of it. It's like the old joke, the secret of good comedy is... Time. Gollum is ushered into the gondola to be sent down to the breeding pits, and one long, black loading screen later, a chapter title card indicates that chapter 3 has now begun, entitled The Breeder, so named, I'm guessing, because Gollum will end this chapter by tinkering with eggs to breed his own bird. Because, yeah, that's the thing that happens in this game. After a few minutes of work in the breeding pits, Gollum ends the day back in his cell, where he continues to plan his escape. Into the tower, into the sewers, to the carts, hide in a crate, and off we goes. Tower, sewer, carts, and off through the gate. The tunnel leads out of the tower, yes? So I have heard. But even if you somehow made it to the carts, the drivers always check their deliveries. And when they find you, it's over. What you need is a cart driver. One who is in on your plan. One you can trust. Is he a cart driver? <laughs> no, I have no desire to die for you. The escape requiring a driver is going to motivate Gollum's actions for most of our second act. But we're close to finally wrapping up our first act, so I want to keep moving. Even though, again, one could write the world's pettiest dissertation on what Sefut the Sand King is or isn't willing to die for. Gollum is summoned up to the Candleman's chambers, and this is where this entire game gets even weirder. Forcing Gollum into a convoluted prison escape isn't enough. We're going to up the narrative ante with some courtly intrigue. From here on out, there's going to be some political tensions between the Mouth of Sauron and the Candleman. And the Mouth of Sauron is like suggesting that he marry the Candleman's daughter, who is the cruel woman that makes occasional appearances down in the pits of despair. You're probably thinking, why? I don't have an answer for you. My working theory is that this was their new vistas that they would reveal by telling Gollum's story here. This is their repose to Tolkien. See, we may have destroyed the magic a bit, but look at this creative new story we're hinting at but not really telling. We're just like you. My daughter has a lovely profile. It reminds me of a sponge. A spark. Soaking everything up without question or resistance. Why does the mouth of Sauron sound like Dennis Reynolds? Silence. He said, a woman's mouth is not for the exiting of words, but for the entrance of a man's dick. Also, if you're curious like I was, nowhere in either The Lord of the Rings or The Hobbits can I find any reference to sponges. I don't think they exist in this universe yet, but then again, they're the ones who did all the research, so maybe we're just supposed to understand that Mordor's cleaning technology vastly exceeds that of hobbits, men, or elves. Gollum also finds the bird that spied his act of sabotage, and it's possible that this is the bird from back in the opening, clearly in the Candleman's service. Believe it or not, I think this is supposed to be foreshadowing for something that happens in Act 3. When he's finally summoned, Gollum first sees the Candleman standing in front of an altar of some kind, well-used candles surrounding a minimalist, white contour of a woman. When we overheard the conversation earlier, the Mouth of Sauron referred to the Candleman's wife using the past tense, so it's likely this is in her honor. I actually like this detail, though I wish the staging and direction were subtler. 
Here in this land of fire and death, the Candleman is so named because of his dedication to his wife's memory. And there's something sympathetic and interesting about that, and I wish we explored his character more. But we don't. This is pretty much it. You must have many questions. <laughs> Our Lord hates questions. Questions. Three ways to silence them. Everything about this exchange is weird, from the bizarrely tender way he's grabbing Gollum's head to the terribly clunky way he starts this interrogation. Oh, you probably have questions, right? Well, f you. Sauron hates questions. Now let me ask you some questions. Then there's just the aesthetics of the transition from decent looking, albeit weird, cutscene to the raw visuals of Gollum, which, ugh. He asks Gollum why he's on the list, why he can't be executed. Gollum doesn't tell him here because apparently Gollum still doesn't know, even though he references the promise he made to Sauron in his gollum Smeagol debate about who to blame for the sabotage. I guess Gollum could be lying, but why? Wouldn't the Gollum half of him be excited to tell one of Sauron's subordinates that he has some connection with the Dark Lord? After that, it's bird breeding time, which, while I was playing, I thought was just as absurd as it sounded. But going over my footage now, I think this is supposed to be part of the Candleman's elaborate plot to figure out what's going on with Gollum. When it's time for Gollum to make his escape, he has to go up through this room here. So in the last 10 minutes, the Candleman has shown Gollum where he keeps important keys, had him breed a bird that can theoretically help him obtain them at some point down the line, and in that action has shown him the very room he'll need to traverse in order to start his escape in earnest. So from an analysis standpoint, is that just terrible pacing and nothing more? Or is this a galaxy brain scheme by the Candleman? Set up Gollum to escape, track him, learn more, maybe get the ring before Sauron does, and then what? Avenge his dead wife? Hand it in to get a higher score on his quarterly review than the mouth of Sauron? We just don't know, and I don't think we ever find out. And that's how we end the first act, with Gollum being taken under the Candleman's wing and some intrigue afoot in the palace that Gollum the character doesn't understand or care about, and Gollum the game will never really address again. The majority of this first act is just repetitive, simplistic platforming that will make you want to launch Gollum into the fires rather than add another piece of wood with a giant white line painted across it. Not only are these confusing stories told poorly, they're just out of place in a game about a tormented halfling whose only real skill is climbing stuff and talking himself into surviving for another miserable day. And even then, I would be less critical if the game demonstrated a commitment to these bad stories, but it doesn't, even though they had years of fictional time to resolve or progress them in interesting ways. That's right, years. That insane time jump I referenced earlier, here it is, in all its wretched glory. Years had passed, and Gollum had risen high in the Candleman's favor, feared now and avoided by the other slaves. In true Gollum fashion, we first learn about this shocking time jump in a loading screen. Gollum's desire to disrupt narrative tradition clearly doesn't stop at telling a ridiculous story with an even more absurd protagonist. They're also inverting the show-don't-tell rule almost every time we're forced to endure a ludicrously long loading screen. Remember that Gollum wasn't necessarily held by Sauron all those years, we just know when he escaped. They chose to have him captured years before his escape. Having Gollum in the slave pits all these years was a deliberate creative choice on their part. The question I can't answer is, why? Neither the player nor Gollum get any extra insight into Mordor or the Candleman. We certainly don't learn anything about our protagonist during that time because when we come back to him now, he's clearly still fixated on escaping. The only thing this time jump serves is that it lets them age up the bird Gollum bread, but that can't be the only reason, right? Smeagol may have been willing to cower in subservience for years, but Gollum, whose existence is built around possessing the ring? We're supposed to believe he just twiddled his gnarly thumbs for years, working away in the beast pens or the breeding pits, a well-behaved slave? A new prisoner is introduced to Gollum's cell, who the prisoners refer to as Grashneg. Means lamb, the new ones. That's what we calls them down here. A carriage driver, the last part of Gollum's plan, is literally thrown into his cell. Nobody cares, but add this to the list of evidence that the Candleman wanted Gollum to escape. Gollum teaches Grashneg how to put beasts in the pen before he's summoned up to see the Candleman. 
As we arrive, the Candleman is in the midst of a conversation with the Mouth of Sauron that implies that they've set some sort of trap that is yet to be sprung. The Black Queen, my favorite spider. For months, she waits in her den for some unlucky prey. Just waits, perfectly still. And then, you don't appreciate my allegory. The virtue of patience, yes. So much to learn from nature. However, when the trap has been set for years and still no prey in sight, we know who starts to doubt that virtue, don't we? The Lord has nothing to worry about. That is what I wish to hear. I shall leave thee to it. Immediately after this, the Candleman asks Gollum about the name Baggins. So are we supposed to understand that the trap these two are referring to is Gollum escaping the slave pits? That would explain the weird sequence at the end of Act 1, but they're also both acknowledging the fact that Sauron seems to want this to happen sooner rather than later, and again, why? If Sauron wants to set Gollum loose and either have him as part of the formal hunt for the ring or secretly follow him, he could do that at any point. Why does Gollum first have to jump through these elaborate hoops? These aren't even skills he would need to be useful in the hunt for the ring either. Make a friend to run the carriage, tame a bird to grab a key, like, really Sauron? Is plan A supposed to be have Gollum escape, secretly follow him to the Shire, then watch him use his bird to steal the ring from Bilbo or Frodo? Is that really plan A for the Dark Lord? Is it, is it even plan B? The Candleman asks about Baggins, and you can be honest or you can lie. It changes the sketch he has done of Bilbo later in the game. Then he has Gollum practice with his bird, and there's more foreshadowing about the bird's allegiance. It did it! It does what we says! Yes. They do not care who we are or what we have done. Unconditional loyalty. I'm not kidding when I say that I think the most clean line of narrative track Daedalic lays in this entire game is this arc of the bird's loyalty. It's still weird and messy like everything else in this game, but it's present in all three acts and has a clearly defined start and end point, which almost nothing else does. The Candleman tries to explain that the elves are the real threat to both himself and Gollum, and it's probably just easier if you hear it for yourself. You know the elves. And they're cunning. They want to fill our Middle Earth with starlight. And when they do, they will know all we have done. All we have done. He seems to be using this threat of exposure as a way to bring them closer together. Gollum obviously has a dark secret, and the Candleman sort of does. The game strongly implies that he betrayed his people and his king. And in double-checking some of the stuff on the wikis, it says that he was forced to execute his wife. That's not something that I found in my playthrough, but also, you know, this game is horrible and I'm not going to play it again to find out more information, so I'll take the wiki's word for it. So, okay, both of them have a darkness they'd rather keep hidden, but this idea of elves flooding the land with starlight and learning all our secrets is completely inconsistent with my understanding of Middle-earth's elves. I could be wrong. If you know your Tolkien and know what he's referring to, let me know. But it's my understanding that most of the remaining elves in Middle-earth are already thinking about their departure into the West. At this point in the novels, Frodo is hearing stories about the elves traveling to the Grey Havens. The elves of Mirkwood might not be sailing into the West, but I also don't think there's anything in the lore about them wanting to fill Middle-earth with starlight or to discover the secrets of weird men. From what I can tell, they're just trying to live as peacefully as possible in their woods. The Candleman asks Gollum about the treasure Bilbo took from him, which again, it's been years, so very strange that they haven't had that conversation before, but his inquiry is interrupted by a summons from the Mouth of Sauron. It seems like this is part of a larger scheme by the Mouth of Sauron and the Candleman's daughter, as once the Candleman leaves, his daughter starts to search his chambers, presumably looking for information about Bilbo or the ring. She discovers the name Shire, and the name of an orc who might know more, and what ensues is a thrilling, chase sequence as Gollum tries to find and kill this orc before the cruel woman can talk to him. During the hunt, Gollum says, They must never find baggings. What happened to the promise he made Sauron about finding the precious? What happened to the Gollum that immediately gave Bilbo's name away to Sauron and the Nazgul when being tortured? Why this sudden desire to protect this information about the Shire? And also, the Nazgul have already been dispatched to search for it. At this point, they've been searching for years. This is supposed to be a tense race against time, but from Gollum's perspective, the stakes are non-existent. Who cares if this sub-faction of the Mouth of Sauron and the Cruel Woman finds this information? They're not going to be more efficient than the Nazgul who've had a six-year head start. If and when the Shire and Baggins are discovered, the ring will be returned to Sauron's clutches one way or another. So Gollum kills the possible informant and returns to his cell, only to find that after all these years, the frail king is finally dead. He wanted to make it count. He 
his death, but it didn't, didn't count for nothing in the end. Despite the sloppy execution, I think there is an interesting and sophisticated story about how this kind of dehumanizing slavery can rob you of everything. Your freedom, your legacy, your hope, all ground to dust by the casual evil of Mordor. That even his opportunity for martyrdom, to die a meaningful death, was taken from him is brutal and morbid, but like we discussed earlier, they don't tell that story well enough. It seems like the king did have multiple opportunities to die on his feet, not to mention the years that have now elapsed off screen. So it's supposed to be a touching end to a subtle and ambitious subplot, but it's just completely unearned. Chapter 4 ends with Gollum and his new cellmate taking a moment of silence for the fallen king. But now, after all these years, Gollum finally has the pieces he needs to make his escape. It's time for a prison break, half a decade in the making. Chapter 5 is called The Traitor. By the end of it, that label could apply to Gollum's friend, Gollum himself for leaving the Candleman, or even Gollum's bird. Guards enter and take Gollum's friend, Grashneg, away for questioning, though Gollum correctly assumes they're going to execute him. He needs Grashneg to drive the cart, so even though he's scared, he decides today has to be the day. If you're on team, this is Candleman's master plan. It is very suspicious timing that this execution which spurs Gollum into action happens right after we overhear a conversation about the trap taking too long. But I also don't know what their plan was for Gollum after he escaped, and I've played the whole game, so the door's still open for this all just being clunky pacing. On the way up to the Candleman's office, Gollum goes over the plan. First, steal key to the bird tower. Second, up, up the bird tower to the execution chamber where we wait for who? The crash net. And then through the train and to the bridge. As a player, I appreciated this because at this point I was very confused about what the plan was supposed to be. It also helps build some momentum for this escape, because the taking of Grashneg doesn't really feel as momentous as I think it's supposed to. Gollum distracts the Candleman by sending his daughter in to speak with him. As he works to free his bird, we overhear the two having what is probably their most honest conversation in years. As Gollum escapes, the Candleman even asks her to stay, saying that they don't spend as much time together anymore. If you care at all, which I don't know that I did, it's a bittersweet moment because Gollum knows that this whole time, the Candleman's daughter has been scheming with the mouth of Sauron and working against her father. This newfound tenderness from him is years too late. Gollum's escape begins, which means about 90 minutes of platforming and bad puzzles. He climbs through the bird tower and we get this hilarious action shot. Somebody really loved these Gollum dives. And then Gollum arrives at the Tower of Light, finding Grashneg's cage just in time to set it loose and send the two of them tumbling down into the sewers. More puzzles ensue, lots of Grashneg whining that I shan't bore you with, and then Gollum finally crawls into a crate, ready to be whisked away to the other side of the bridge. But of course, there's a catch, because nothing in this game can go smoothly, and an orc notices Gollum's cage and thinks it's a body that's supposed to be sent down to the catacombs for inspection. Why the orcs have catacombs is beyond me, but Gollum escapes them, which involves a strange amount of spiders, before reuniting with Grashneg out by the carts. Grashneg is nervous about hiding Smeagol again, and asks that Smeagol find another way out of the tower, so there's a slight change of plan. Smeagol believes they'll just meet back up outside the tower and escape together, and that this is only a temporary separation. When Smeagol does escape the tower, he sees Grashneg look up, see him, and then choose to drive away by himself, out of the slave pits and into freedom, abandoning his friend. Gollum and Smeagol are united in their feelings of betrayal and hatred, and they seethe as they descend the tower. I know it sounds like I'm talking a lot about this escape, but this is about two hours of gameplay that I've condensed down to about half a page. Gollum still escapes by jumping on top of a cart that's already departing, and then navigating these uh, thrilling obstacles to reach the other side undetected. With Gollum finally out of the slave pits, we cut briefly back to the Mirkwood interrogation, with Gandalf losing patience, before we flash back to Gollum again. He's returned to his old cave, and he's making a new drawing on the wall, a giant ring. His bird returns having found something, and Gollum climbs out of the cave to see what it is. As it happens, we're hearing the present day conversation between Gollum and Gandalf about the moment Deagle found the ring, and Smeagol killed him for it. This takes on additional meaning, because Gollum's bird leads him up to a vantage point where he sees Grashneg, his old friend, wandering the mountains after his escape. 
The presentation of this moment leads us to compare these two doomed friendships, but before we address that, there's another detail that irked me. When talking to Gollum about his friendship with Deagle, Gandalf says, He was your only friend, Deagle. The only one who talked to you, though he did not like you much. Nobody did. And the reason I dislike this moment is because it lessens the tragedy of Smeagol's corruption. If he was vile and disliked before possessing the ring, it cheapens his fall afterwards. This is also just one of the many times this game ignores or overwrites the original text. Smeagol is described like this. There was among them a family of high repute, for it was large and wealthier than most, and it was ruled by a grandmother of the folk, stern and wise in old lore such as they had. The most inquisitive and curious-minded of that family was called Smeagol. He was interested in roots and beginnings, he dived into deep pools, he burrowed under trees and growing plants, he tunneled into green mounds, and he ceased to look up at the hilltops or the leaves on the trees or the flowers opening in the air. His head and eyes were downward. So he's inquisitive, he's curious-minded, these are descriptions with positive connotations. When he kills Deagle and gets his hands on the ring, we can start to see those once positive traits be warped by the ring's dark power. He was very pleased with his discovery and he concealed it, and he used it to find out secrets, and he put his knowledge to crooked and malicious uses. He became sharp-eyed and keen-eared for all that was hurtful. The ring had given him power according to his stature. It is not to be wondered at that he became very unpopular and was shunned, when visible, by all his relations. So he's no longer inquisitive and curious-minded, he's now sharp-eyed and keen-eared for all that was hurtful. We can explicitly see that he became very unpopular, obviously implying that a pre-Ring Smeagol was accepted in a way that the post-Ring Smeagol was not. It's certainly not a huge moment in this game, but it's just another one of the many ways I think Daedalic doesn't seem to understand this world or characters the way that you'd expect them to, given that they set out to make such a weird niche title. So Gollum meets up with Grashneg and sees him as his opportunity to make it through Shelob's cave alive. This meet up in the mountains and escape from Shelob's lair is an entire chapter of the game, and the choice at the end is whether to warn Grashneg about Shelob or just let her eat him. She kills him either way, but the Smeagol choice forgives Grashneg and tries to save him, and the Gollum choice obviously doesn't. We also found out back in Act 1 that Grashneg means lamb, it's what they call the new prisoners. So this is Gollum using the closest thing he has to a friend as a sacrificial lamb. I guess that's sad, but nobody's really expecting anything else from Gollum, and he'll try to do the same thing to Frodo in a year or so. This is yet another moment in the untold story of Gollum that's just a dress rehearsal for a story that was already told, and told much better, in the pages of The Lord of the Rings. I think Tolkien understood the limitations of this character. His struggle is interesting, but his struggle can't really sustain a 10 to 12 hour standalone narrative. Gollum's torment is so singular, his bending towards evil too fixed. Tolkien called this his persistent wickedness here in Letter 181. Gollum was pitiable, but he ended in persistent wickedness, and the fact that this worked good was no credit to him. His marvelous courage and endurance, as great as Frodo and Sam's, or greater, being devoted to evil was portentous, but not honorable. I am afraid, whatever our beliefs, we have to face the fact that there are persons who yield to temptation, reject their chance of nobility or salvation, and appear to be damnable. Gollum didn't need to be an engaging protagonist in The Lord of the Rings. He could just be Gollum, an interesting side character who fails to overcome his temptation at essentially every pivotal moment in his life. In this game, however, they obviously need him to be more, and he just… he can't be that without it starting to feel farcical. Gollum is just so poorly cut out to be the protagonist of anything, but especially at this time in his life. This is a universe that adores its scrappy, non-traditional heroes, but even the lovably lowly hobbits have agency to make choices, have room to grow as their stories progress. Gollum, however, doesn't, at least not in this. Two of the four most important moments of his life have already happened, the killing of Deagle and the losing of the ring. I would say that his near repentance in the novels that we'll cover later, and his role in the ring's destruction would be the two pivotal moments that are yet to come. So he's almost required to be static in this story, and that's not something you want from a protagonist, especially if your side characters are just as dull. So there's essentially no tragic arc available to him, and there's no classic tragedy here either. The tragedy has occurred. This split-second decision to kill his friend for the mysterious ring has cursed him to this long and miserable existence. I'm not saying this would make a better game, but if we played through Smeagol's life before he killed Deagle, you could turn this into more of a tragedy. We could see why he would be compelled in the moment to do such a horrible thing. 
Here in Gollum, we just have moments where he loses friends because he's never able to overcome his desire to recover the ring. But that's all still connected back to that core tragic moment that we don't experience in the game. Even his suffering is uncompelling because of the way Daedalic decided to handle the Gollum Smeagol split. There isn't really a moment where Smeagol just confronts all of the horrible things he's done in his life, like we sometimes see from other tragic characters, because he's never alone. Gollum is always there to justify, to assuage, to distract. And that's fine, that's partially why the Gollum side exists, but that's the other thing that drives me crazy. This game doesn't seem interested in what I think is one of the more compelling mysteries left to explore with Gollum, which is, how real is that Smeagol Gollum split? Are we really seeing two unconnected personalities, two streams of consciousness inside of one freaky little body? Or is the Gollum identity just the mask he hides behind when threatened or thinking about the ring? How do those answers change how Smeagol views himself? I don't believe the novels give us a firm answer, so Daedalic could have actually done some exploring here. But instead, from that first Smeagol Gollum debate and all the subsequent dialogue, they essentially treat these characters as two separate entities that happen to be sharing the same body and don't bother to interrogate further. So Smeagol never has a moment of accountability or reflection or even pause really, which makes it hard to connect with him as a tragic protagonist. When I was reading up on tragic structure and tragic protagonists for this video, obviously there's a lot of stuff about your more Aristotelian tragic heroes, Oedipus, Macbeth, Othello. And this isn't super Gollum related, but Tolkien knew his way around that kind of hero. Not only did he study and translate the tragic Finnish tale of Colorvo, but he essentially adapts and incorporates it into his legendarium with the story of Turin. It's another moment where I find myself incredulous that this is the story they went with. Even if you wanted to tell a darker Middle-earth story about a lesser known character, especially if you wanted to try and tell a tragic story, there were so many other options. Daedalic clearly didn't have a compelling Gollum story to tell, at least not one that's recognizable in the final product, so if you want to make something dark and weird, why not find a story that can actually support that vision? I let Shelob eat Grashneg, and with his screams in the background, we fade to black, returning to Mirkwood as Gandalf's interrogation reaches a critical moment. That's when you murdered him. Right there by the river, in the flower beds. You killed your friend. We're clearly supposed to be connecting Deagle and Grashneg to see these individuals as victims of Gollum's selfishness and cruelty. But Grashneg is just so disloyal and burdensome throughout the gameplay of the escape that as players you really do feel a sense of relief when he's gone. It doesn't feel like a tragedy at all. When Gandalf leaves the cell, we get an exchange that's part lampshading but mostly an expression of narrative crisis. What did he say? Too much about too little. Depending on how you look at it, this is either the last scene of our second act or the first scene of our third act. If you're two thirds of the way through your story and the wisest character in it is like, wow, that was a boring waste of time. That's a sign you need to rework your entire story. Because if your story was exhausting for Gandalf to hear, just imagine how dull it is to play. So on that wildly self-aware note, our second act ends. Gollum's escape from Mordor was successful, but it's clear that some kind of trap had been set by the Candleman and the Mouth of Sauron. Despite its flaws, the second act feels tighter than the first, and the biggest issue for me is the time jump. Gollum didn't have to spend years in the slave pits, so why did they make his capture as early as they did? It can't just be for the bird growing up, right? My hunch is that originally the King, the Candleman, Grashneg, and Gollum's escape was all supposed to be Act 1. And Act 2 was going to be Gollum escaping the mountains of Cirith Ungol and wandering through the Dead Marshes before he is caught by Aragorn, with occasional cuts back to Mordor where the Candleman and the Mouth of Sauron would be scheming. Act 3 would probably play out the way it does now, things would just make a bit more sense. Because as of now, Gollum's capture by Aragorn is covered in a loading screen, which I suppose could have been a deliberate choice, but given the insane mess of this game's first act, I think it's more likely that this iconic moment was originally going to be in the game, but was removed for budgetary reasons. To adapt, they had to pad out the Mordor section to fill two acts instead of one. In the novel, Aragorn describes their journey like this, And then, by fortune, I came suddenly on what I sought, the marks of soft feet beside a muddy pool. But now the trail was fresh and swift, and it led not to Mordor, but away. Along the skirts of the dead marshes I followed it, and then I had him. Lurking by a stagnant mirror, peering into the water as a dark eve fell, I caught him, Gollum.
He was covered with green slime. He will never love me, I fear, for he bit me, and I was not gentle. Nothing more did I ever get from his mouth than the marks of his teeth. I deemed it the worst part of all my journey, the road back, watching him day and night, making him walk before me with a halter on his neck, gagged until he was tamed by the lack of drink and food, driving him ever towards Mirkwood. So in Daedalic's defense, a book-accurate depiction of that journey doesn't give Gollum a lot of wiggle room for platforming and antics and talking with the future king of Gondor. But this was a 50-day journey with one of the franchise's most iconic characters. If they're willing to have Gollum play in the slave pits for years, bungle Smeagol's backstory, give the elves a weird domineering motive, talk about sponges, then I'd be surprised if this wasn't something they also felt like they could change if necessary. Saying, hey, what if Aragorn and Smeagol have to occasionally work together to traverse the dangerous lands of Middle-earth is less of a narrative stretch than Gollum becomes the veteran of the slave pits for years, stealing glass bottles to trade for bread and intimidating the new kid. Don't get me wrong, this game still probably wouldn't justify its own existence even if it did have the sequence with Aragorn in the middle, but we might have addressed that too much about too little problem the game obviously knows it has. But now we're through the worst of it, because Gollum's adventures in Mirkwood are more visually pleasant, if not more exciting from a gameplay perspective. The story though, it gets even weirder. After the dull plot and color palette of Mordor, Gollum's adventures in Mirkwood feel like a breath of fresh air. We've moved from total incompetence to staunch inadequacy. Both the player and Gollum will find Mirkwood more pleasant than Mordor, but to be fair, both the player and Gollum would still rather be somewhere else. Gandalf asks that the elves let Gollum out to roam as part of his treatment. When they do, he hears the pleas of his fellow prisoner, an elf named Mel. I just want to leave. The king won't see you. Not today, not tomorrow, not in a hundred years. She's one of the more interesting characters of this third act. In some ways, she's the elven Smeagol, ostracized, obsessed, and growing more so by the day as a result of her isolation. This third act is built around her character and this mystery of her imprisonment, and by the end, it's enough that if you really squint, you can see what they were probably trying to do. That's about as complimentary as I can get in this game. Oh wait, no, there's this too. He's not going to eat that, is he? Will you move any time? Oh no. He ate it. <sighs> I like this. It's a little funny. As Gollum searches the grounds for ways to escape, you can come across some of the ruined barrels from Bilbo and the dwarves when they made their famed escape. There's also a moment later in the act when Gollum climbs a tower and you can see the lonely mountain and lake town off in the distance. Gollum's unplanned solo escape attempt goes about as well as you'd expect. He didn't try to run. He just went for a swim and got lost. See that shifting wall of mist in the distance? Above the last line of trees? We call it the Ring of Haze. Haze! A haze so dense you can't see five paces ahead, tricking your mind like a twisted, willful mirror until you're utterly lost. And sooner or later, no matter how hard you try or how far you walk, all paths will lead you back to us. So there's a new force that's stopping his escape. But before he slinks back to his cell, his bird from the slave pits calls out to him, and his elven guards just don't notice or care. Bird! Bird must find help! Elves have caught us, terrible spirits! Bird must find someone! Someone fast! Go! Go! We don't see it yet, but this bird will fly back to the Candleman in Mordor and is the reason the orcs attack Mirkwood. It's an interesting way to make Gollum complicit in that attack, but what I don't understand is whose help Gollum thinks this bird is going to get. If he meant it to go to Mordor, then that's Gollum thinking that he's better off in the clutches of the Candleman than the elves of Mirkwood, which is absurd, even from what we've seen already. There's no indication from Gollum that he just means to escape in the chaos of battle, this just feels like a bit of a plot hole, and one of the weirdest moments in this game, and that's saying a lot. There's the other reading where Gollum thinks the bird is going to get some other kind of help, 
but he returns instead to the Candleman, his true master that was hinted at a few times back in Act 2. But if that's what they were going for, it would have been better just to have the bird spy Gollum from a distant branch and report back to the Candleman. The guards tell Smeagol that the elf who tamed the Haze was the king's nephew, Gwendil, also known as the Master of Riddles, but he's vanished and presumed dead. Smeagol is curious, and they tell him to go ask Mel about it. You know, if you have two dangerous, mentally unstable prisoners, it's always a great idea to set them up to conspire together. What could go wrong there? A plus guard work. After Mel rebuffs him, Gollum talks to the cook to learn more about her. She was part of Gwendol's circle. The Riddle Master. Our most brilliant mind. He and his scholars tried to protect our realm with spells, but the Mirkwood devoured them all. Mel was the only one who returned, blinded and confused but alive. Whatever darkness touched her, she did not know or would not tell. When Gollum mentions Gwendil to Mel, including the fact that he's heard elves discussing rumors of his re-emergence, he finally gets her attention. She offers to guide him through the haze and out of Mirkwood if he helps her find out more about Gwendil. I think this is supposed to be another parallel to Gollum's character. Like Gollum, she was imprisoned, and like Gollum, it's the thought of recovering her most important relationship that motivates her escape. Hardly earth-shattering, I know, but I do think that they're doing this very deliberately. Freeing Mel requires finding a lost bell, and I'm not exaggerating when I say that this takes about two hours for various tedious reasons. This section contains one of my favorite moments of the game, Smeagol's leap of faith off the Elven Towers. Break a leg. Part of finding the bell requires going into the Riddle Master's old room and finding a magic spell that will let Gollum breathe underwater to sneak into the king's bedroom to find the magic bell. And we can blissfully skip most of that, but one thing I want to note is that this is what the Riddle Master's bed looks like. This is upsetting for many reasons, obviously. Very strange that this wise, elven Riddle Master would sleep in a stodgy four-poster bed. But also, there's a minimum of ten pillows on this bed. This is one of the more powerful wood elves in Mirkwood, and he's hoarding pillows like he's Joanna Gaines. Gollum grabs the bell from the king's chambers, but things take a turn when the king and Gandalf enter, arguing about the ring. The king tries to get information from Gandalf about it, and even offers to hide it here in Mirkwood, but Gandalf cuts him down to size. The king kicks him out in retaliation, and implies ominously that he's going to talk to Gollum himself to learn more about the treasure. Fear not. We will take good care of your prisoner. So the elves are sent to retrieve Gollum for further questioning, but with a magic bell in hand, he's able to free Mel, and the two make their escape. As they flee, they cement their bond. Has it nice memories? I'd have to go back a long time for that. Smeagol too, very long time. They escape into the forest, ending chapter 7, and for the first time all game we leave Smeagol's point of view and cut back to Mordor. Gollum's bird has returned and reported to the Candleman. The mouth of Sauron is worried what Gandalf might learn from Gollum. The Grey Beggar might suspect something. Join Marhok's men in Dol Guldur. Free the creature. Bring it back. Kill it if need be. This is a death sentence. Only if one dies. I'm hoping that's a consequence of poor localization because yikes that last line there. After that scene we see the Candleman looking at the picture of the old king he was staring at earlier. I think the man he betrayed. He shoots a crossbow bolt into the king's side and walks away. This is one of the subplots that I don't really understand. Maybe it's explained a bit more in the lore compendium that I refused to pay more money for. We know that he betrayed his people, the wikis tell me that he was forced by Sauron to kill his wife, but the mouth of Sauron references him still needing redemption, and it seems to be related to this old king he betrayed here. It's not necessarily a bad thing to leave questions unanswered, that's something Tolkien writes a lot about in his letters, but this doesn't feel like a narrative vista, it feels like slapdash work to give your antagonist some artificial gravitas and dimensionality. Whether this lack of information is a consequence of poor storytelling or a deliberate choice to evoke certain elements of Tolkien's world, it really doesn't work for me at all. We come back to Smeagol and Mel navigating Mirkwood, slowly and carefully making their way to the haze. Leading Mel into filthy woods, very selflessly, yes. This woods section introduces magic bugs that can make characters tell the truth. I wish that was a joke, apparently you can get around it by eating some lichen, but the game thinks this idea is so clever it brings it back again in a later chapter back in Mirkwood. I'm not sure they realized how universe breaking this would be. 
if these bugs existed, especially in Mirkwood, wouldn't Gandalf have used them to talk to Gollum? Might Saruman have tracked and used them to get information from Gandalf? There are a lot of times in the novels when the plot relies on characters keeping secrets or being deceitful. Apparently they're lucky everyone just forgot about magic truth bugs. They plan to spend the night in an abandoned tower. Gollum's bird swings by, and after everyone tucks into bed, they're attacked by mysterious purple balls. The objective says to escape the creatures. So these are creatures, apparently? I don't know what's happening here, and I am not brave enough to Google Gollum purple balls to try to learn more that way. Our heroes escape, Gollum through his agility, and Mel through the guiding whispers of the riddle master that she claims to hear. They press forward to a grove where the ritual occurred, and Gollum solves a puzzle so that Mel can recreate it to temporarily break the spell. Here you can also finish an earlier game of riddles with Mel, and we get this bit here which did make me smile. What? What has it got in its pocketses? What do I have in my pocketses? That's not a riddle. No, it's not, is it? Baggins cheated. Vindication! This game has its moments. Mel is tired after the ceremony and takes a moment to rest, asking Smeagol to describe the area to her. Wait, you mentioned flowers. You didn't picture those. Irises. The entire glade used to be overgrown with them. They must be in full bloom now. Yellow ones, yes, but not very nice. All withered. Not many. Irises! Oh, uh, time is not spent. Iris, Iris has no sense. Tico's riddle. We remember. I remember. He solved the riddle from the opening, and in doing so, he becomes more Smeagol than he's ever been in this game. We even get that haunting, I remember. He tries to suggest the two travel together, looking out for each other that maybe they should just forget about the riddle master. Mel won't give up though, and Smeagol starts to have flashbacks about the day he killed Deagle. There was irises everywhere. Yellow ones, like here, and there. Light Deagle, and looked up into the sky. No, 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 wake up! We didn't do it! It wasn't us! We did nothing, nothing! Try to steal it. Try to get away with our precious. Uh, Mel must believe us. She believes us, yes. But Mel is gone. This moment is very interesting to me because I think this is the closest we get to Gollum ever being healed. It's not the warmth of the elves that does it. It's the friendship and acceptance of a fellow outcast. Someone seeing him as more than a monster. That, combined with the irises, seems to reawaken a part of him that's been dormant for decades. When Mel reacts to this moment by saying, you are mad, it vanishes, and Gollum re-emerges to defend his actions. I think this moment is very similar to one of Tolkien's favorite Gollum moments that he mentions a few times in his letters. In letter 96 to his son Christopher in 1945, he writes, For myself, I was probably most moved by Sam's disquisition on the seamless web of story, and by the scene when Frodo goes to sleep on his breast, and the tragedy of Gollum, who at that moment came within a hair of repentance, but for one rough word from Sam. Ten years later, in a letter to a publisher, Letter 165, he's still citing that one moment as a personal favorite. I am most stirred by the sound of the horses of the Rohirrim at Cockcrow, and most grieved by Gollum's failure, just, to repent when interrupted by Sam. This seems to me really like the real world in which the instruments of just retribution are seldom themselves just or holy, and the good are often stumbling blocks. I think the moment he's referring to is this one on the stairs of Kirith Ungle. Gollum looked at them. A strange expression passed over his lean, hungry face. The gleam faded from his eyes, and they went dim and gray, old and tired. A spasm of pain seemed to twist him, and he turned away, peering back towards the pass, shaking his head as if engaged in some interior debate. Then he came back, and slowly putting out a trembling hand, very cautiously he touched Frodo's knee, but almost the touch was a caress. For a fleeting moment, could one of the sleepers have seen him, 
they would have thought that they beheld an old, weary hobbit, shrunken by the years that had carried him far beyond his time, beyond friends and kin, and the fields and streams of youth, an old, starved, pitiable thing. Sam wakes up and confronts him, and afterwards we see an immediate change in Gollum. Gollum withdrew himself, and a green glint flickered under his heavy lids. Almost spider-like he looked now, crouched back on his bent limbs, with his protruding eyes. The fleeting moment had passed, beyond recall. I think Daedalic was trying to create another one of these moments where it feels like, against all odds, hope and redemption is within reach, only to have it fade away. For, quote, good to be a stumbling block to go back to the language Tolkien used in his letter. Of course Mel is disturbed by this. I think she's a virtuous character trying to follow her heart, but she doesn't have the boundless pity and patience needed to help Smeagol finally break through here. This is a complicated moment to pull off, from the irises that have been a through line all game to Mel's pity and acceptance being similar enough to what Smeagol would go on to find in Frodo. And while it's messy, I think it's ultimately effective. We do feel a tragic sense of what might have been, even though we knew all along Smeagol was doomed. But with that said, that's a story that's already been told, I would say better, certainly more efficiently, in the pages of The Lord of the Rings. So while this moment is, in my opinion at least, the most interesting and effective moment of the game, it's just a rehash of a story and a character beat that already exists in the canon. Smeagol tries to find Mel in the mist, but he just gets lost, wandering in the purple haze, growing increasingly despondent. When he finds himself back in the clearing, he's not alone. This can't be the other side. No, it's not. <laughs> the elven guards have caught up with him, and their king wants to know more about the ring. Gollum's penultimate chapter is very strange. After escaping the palace, wandering Mirkwood with Mel, and a moment of near redemption, we move on to... party planning. Smeagol is helping the elves plan their upcoming party for most of this chapter. Smeagol can help. Yes, I can find strange lights. Gollum's role in this chapter is notably minimal. For this chapter, it's pretty much all Smeagol. The truth bugs come back, though Smeagol knows how to trick them. He uses them on his elven guards who reveal that the mirror in the Candlemaster's bedroom was magical in some way, so Smeagol is off to investigate. We can gloss over most of this. Smeagol hears the voices of both Mel and the Riddlemaster, and learns that the Riddlemaster was trapped in the King's old summer residence, trying to control the source of the haze, and Mel is trying to find him. To learn more about the old king's abandoned summer palace, Smeagol attends the midsummer party the elves are throwing. He's at the top of the great tree when his bird descends to greet him, and Smeagol sees orcs attacking the forest. In the novels, when Legolas is relaying this moment at the Council of Elrond, he says, It was that very night of summer, yet moonless and starless, that orcs came on us at unawares. We drove them off after some time. They were many and fierce, but they came from over the mountains, and they were unused to the woods. When the battle was over, we found that Gollum was gone, and his guards were slain or taken. It then seemed plain to us that the attack had been made for his rescue, and that he knew of it beforehand. How that was contrived, we cannot guess, but Gollum is cunning, and the spies of the enemy are many. Smeagol does use this moment to escape, and he did accidentally bring the enemy to Mirkwood by asking his bird to get help. That's why that moment baffles me so much, because when the orcs show up here, Gollum is scared of them, he's upset that they're here. And yet where else would his bird possibly fly to go get help? So in a way we're getting some new context for this moment from the novels, but it's difficult to enjoy because it's just very shoddily constructed. This moment also causes Gollum to reawaken, as it were, and become much more prominent. Smeagol can either save his elf friends when he can, or let the orcs kill them all. I try to save as many as I could, which included helping one of Gollum's guards kill the Beastmaster from the slave pits. Why he's here when there's no beasts, I can't say. Gollum escapes, and we get what's hopefully our last bit of important story content conveyed via loading screen. Gollum wants to find the Riddlemaster, Smeagol just wants to find Mel. Why does Gollum want to find the Riddlemaster if his bird can apparently guide Mel and the orcs through the haze? I don't know. Does Gollum think that the Riddlemaster, who found powerful magic in the haze and immediately used it to protect his home, would help him find powerful magic in the ring and not immediately use it to protect his home? I don't know that either. Gollum finds the old summer palace, sneaks through the ruins, and finds Mel, surrounded by the Candleman and his orcs. Before he can attempt a rescue, he falls down and is surrounded. 
We know how to open the gate. Go on then. Help her. Open the gate and you both live. Oh, so the Candleman needs information from our heroes that they don't want to divulge? Damn, seems like he could uh, use some truth bugs right now. If he was going to get caught anyway, it would have been nice to have it happen in a cutscene before Gollum subjects you to 15 to 20 minutes of the same tedious sneaking you've been doing all game. But hey, with gameplay this good, I guess you just can't pass up a chance for a final rigorous stealth gauntlet. This is so boring and forever taking. Mel knows the door is magic though. So when she and Gollum open it, it blinds the baddies and they slip inside, the door shutting behind them. The reaction from the Candleman, devious servant of Sauron, is lacking to say the least. Mel and Gwendol reunite inside the palace. Gwendol says that the only way to keep the Candleman from getting the source of the haze, whatever that means, is to destroy it. Destroying the haze requires closing two towers. Gwendol takes the left tower and Gollum takes the right. As he climbs, Gollum and Smeagol debate what's next. Smeagol wants Mel to journey with him and resents the Riddle Master for coming between them. Gollum just wants to escape and find the ring. There's an interesting moment where you can try to renounce the precious as Smeagol, and then we see how quickly Gollum manipulates the conversation. Never. Precious only ever made us lonely. And how long until the Dark Lord finds us, eh? How long after he finds our ring? We must find it. Find it before he does. And hide it forever. Never use it. And never, never kill for the precious ever again. This battle inside Smeagol, his reckoning with his loneliness and his newfound desire for Mel's company is setting up one of the most contrived moral dilemmas I've seen in a game in a long time. Gollum closed his tower, but the Riddle Master hasn't done his part. When Gollum goes to investigate, he finds the Riddle Master, the powerful, magic-wielding elf, collapsed on the ground. Because... I tried to take the stairs. There are no stairs. Exactly. So it's up to Gollum to close the second tower, which he does. When he returns to the wounded Riddle Master, oh no, an orcish crossbowman has just appeared in the room. The Riddle Master, who mere moments ago levitated half a dozen separate slabs of stone to form stairs for Gollum, is clearly powerless and will be killed unless Gollum intervenes. Obviously ridiculous. The Gollum side wants to intervene and kill the orc, and the Smeagol side wants to let him die so he can theoretically keep traveling with Mel to have a friend again. Gollum's argument is essentially that Smeagol's friends all suffer, like Grashneg, like the Frail Man, like Deagle. Smeagol says that the Precious can't protect them anymore, so they need someone who can. I think for a while I struggled with this moment because it felt odd to me that Daedalic was giving the morally superior choice to Gollum and the more evil one to Smeagol, but when I think about it more, I think it works well for the character. Smeagol is cowardly and conniving. He killed his old friend to become a ring bearer. There was always that selfishness and evil inside of him. It's not isolated to Gollum. And then the Gollum side knows that doing this is going to ensure that Mel stays with Gwendol and Smeagol will be forced to keep traveling alone. So while this powerful elf shouldn't be in this situation at all, I think the two sides of this argument work for me in the abstract. So in my playthrough, Gollum saved the Riddle Master. If you let the Riddle Master die, Gollum takes the ring hanging around his neck and things get a little weird. After the fight with the Candleman, Mel quickly ascertains that Smeagol played a part in Gwendol's death and leaves his company, possibly to die by herself back in the ruins. Here, the Riddle Master is still alive, and Gollum returns to the main chamber to find the Candleman doing vague, boring acts of evil on the source of the haze. Oh no. So Gollum tells Mel to stay there and hide while he destroys the source. 
He climbs the circling platforms and somehow musters the strength of a Greek god to impale the source with a giant metal bar that just so happens to hang directly in front of it. There's a lot of things about this game that I don't understand, and this climax is pretty high up on the list. This is not a game that needed this bombastic cinematic climax. There's also some confused shouting about the Candleman summoning Sauron through the haze, which makes this climax horribly similar to that Justice League movie. Gollum has spent 12 hours straining credulity, but here I think it finally breaks. But there's still the Candleman that needs to be dealt with. I don't think we can call this a boss fight. Gollum just creeps through the rubble to get close enough to strike. He thinks he has when his bird swoops in and alerts the Candleman to Gollum's presence. Oh no, Gollum is about to die. No, don't worry, now the bird is Gollum's friend again, despite betraying his location to the orcs, leading them through the haze, and literally betraying Gollum again three seconds ago. The bird attacks the Candleman, distracting him long enough for Gollum to come in and choke his lights out. Oh wait, I forgot to mention this whole time the game has been building up the Candleman's evil catchphrase right before he kills someone, and it's, um, creative, I guess. Where does the sun go up? Where does the sun go up? What do I care? We are orcs. We don't need the sun to show us the way. You! Where does the sun go up? I don't even know what to do with that, frankly. So yes, the Candleman is dead and the day is saved. The game tries to make it sound like Gollum's actions have done a great service for the elves. After he's done smooching Mel, the Riddle Master says, The elves of Mirkwood can no longer hide. War is upon us, and no haze will protect us now. You may have awakened us just in time. It's funny that it's framed like, Wow, Smeagol, you woke the sleeping giant. This might just save the realm. The same realm whose legendary champion just lost a fight to a staircase. And we don't really hear about any of the deeds of the Mirkwood Elves in The Lord of the Rings, except for Legolas. Throughout my drafts of this, I kept coming back to this moment because it feels close to a Lord of the Rings climax. I think it's trying to emulate the bittersweet tone of Fellowship's or Two Towers' ending. Fellowship ends with Boromir trying to take the ring from Frodo, Frodo realizing he has to do this alone, and setting off to do just that before Sam chases him down. This is that moment, though the literal end of the novel is a few pages later. Frodo rose to his feet. A great weariness was on him, but his will was firm and his heart lighter. He spoke aloud to himself. I will do now what I must, he said. This, at least, is plain. The evil of the ring is already at work even in the company, and the ring must leave them before it does more harm. I will go alone. Some I cannot trust, and those I can trust are too dear to me. Poor old Sam, and Merry, and Pippin. Strider, too. His heart yearns for Minas Tirith, and he will be needed there now Boromir has fallen into evil. I will go alone. At once. In the novels, Boromir's sacrifice doesn't happen until the first chapter of Two Towers, though for what it's worth, I like Peter Jackson shifting that moment to Fellowship. But the Fellowship book ends with one of the strongest, most virtuous men in Middle-earth finally succumbing to the ring, but it's that moment of darkness that leads Frodo to having this moment of clarity and courage. And who knows, if things didn't happen with the timing that they did, if Frodo hadn't left by the time Saruman's Urukai arrived, we could be looking at a much darker ending. So it's far from happy at the time. Gandalf is presumed dead, Boromir wavers, and Frodo and Sam head off to continue their dangerous quest alone. But there's a hope there, with Frodo's determination and Sam's love and loyalty. The Two Towers ends on a similar note. Frodo is captured by orcs after being attacked by Shelob, but Sam thought he was dead. So there's that little ray of hope. The book ends with the line, Frodo was alive, but taken by the enemy. So this moment, if Gollum's self-serving quest to escape the elves and return to his hunt for the ring has inadvertently brought about this sliver of hope, that feels consistent with the bittersweet endings of the first two books. Yes, Mirkwood was attacked and there were many casualties and Smeagol flirted with redemption but faltered, but the Candleman is dead, the Beastmaster is dead, the Haze will never be used by Sauron or other dark forces. And now the Mirkwood Elves are, according to this one line, so we just have to take their word for it, awake. And we know that Gollum's failure to recover here means that he'll later be in the right place at the right time to destroy the ring and save all of Middle-earth. So originally when I wrote this essay for Gollum, I had that staircase joke and I moved on. 
But the more I thought about it, the more I think they were deliberately trying to evoke a certain Tolkienian denouement where our heroes are still standing, but it doesn't exactly feel like victory. And if that's what they were going for, I think we can't call it a total failure. If this was a story that was expecting another chapter, it kind of does feel Tolkien adjacent. So let's touch on the closing moments. I promise we're almost done. Finally free after all these years, Gollum heads off into the wilderness. Into the mountains, sweet one. And under the mountains. And then into the Shire. He won't have to make this journey alone, however. His bird is back. And in the final choice of the game, we get this. I guess, technically, the bird does betray him, since I'm not sure he meant for it to go fetch the orcs. And the final showdown kind of implies that the bird was supposed to be loyal to the Candleman before changing its mind at the last minute. So the Gollum choice would be to punish the bird for its betrayal and continue to travel alone. Smeagol just wants to forgive it. Gollum is locked in the cycle of misery. He's possessed the ring for too long, and now he seems to poison everything he touches. I think Act 1 is establishing that baseline and introducing new characters, Act 2 is letting that cycle play out with the Grashnag relationship, and Act 3 gives Gollum the chance to recognize that cycle and break it as much as he can, and to give Mel, his counterpart, a happily ever after that he knows he'll never have himself. So yes, we could look at this moment of forgiveness with the bird and see that as Smeagol trying to break the cycle and extend grace to others. But because they also did so much work setting up Mel as almost the elven golem, touched by darkness, isolated, fixated on one thing, by saving Gwendol and putting her happiness above his, he's already broken that cycle. But that was Gollum acting with ulterior motives, whereas I guess this is Smeagol with nothing to lose. It's a moment that clearly thinks it has some gravitas, but like so much of this game, everything leading up to it is too muddled to let us see things well enough to make a judgement. We don't know if Gollum thinks this bird betrayed him when he said, go get help, and the bird went to the only place he could possibly think of. If Gollum doesn't think the bird bringing the orcs is betrayal, his killing it here is just arbitrary cruelty. Which isn't necessarily out of character, but it'd be nice to know that that's what's happening here and not just an act of revenge. I spared the bird. It survived the runtime of Gollum, and as far as I'm concerned, that's punishment enough. There is something foul about that bird. Very foul! The closing scene is Gollum creeping through Moria when he gets to two great stone doors. He can't open them. As he keeps pushing, the camera moves into the dark rock before we transition to an exterior shot of the doors of Durin, firmly shut. He's trapped in Moria, which is right where he needs to be for his first appearance in the Fellowship of the Ring. This detail about the door isn't just fan service either. One of the appendices in Return of the King speculates that he probably got stuck behind this door. All trace of Gollum is lost. It is thought that at this time, being hunted by both the elves and Sauron's servants, he took refuge in Moria. But when he had at last discovered the way to the West Gate, he could not get out. So what on Middle Earth is this game doing? When I was going over my notes for the first time, I thought I could have a nice little button about how by protecting Gwendol and ensuring Mel doesn't become more like him, he's giving her up and accepting his loneliness, which will doom him. But there's some tragic elements there. Of course, if he lets Gwendol die to try to keep Mel close, she quickly discovers this treachery and banishes him actively. Either way, he's alone, but one feels like tragedy and the other a bit like justice. But of course, he doesn't protect Gwendol out of nobility, he doesn't do it to save Mel. Gollum does it to ensure that the precious is all they have. So, especially if you don't want to consider Gollum as a part one, and just want to consider it as a finished product on its own terms, it's weirdly a rejection of a typical narrative satisfaction that unites a lot of these plot lines. Sefud the Sand Flood King wants one last gasp of glory, to die on his feet. He doesn't get it. He dies of starvation in a cell. If you want martyrdom, bravery, to see a spark of hope in an endless sea of darkness, you're not going to get it. The Candleman wants redemption, he wants his daughter to love him and understand why he's made the choices he has. He wants his sacrifices to have been for something, and none of that's resolved. He gets choked out by a 45 pound schizoid and dies alone. You want revenge, redemption, power, you're not going to get it. 
And if you want nobility, if you want Gollum or Smeagol to have recovered, to finally put someone else's happiness above their own selfish desires, you're not going to get it. There really isn't a poetic button to put on the game, but it's hard to tell if it's deliberately crafted to reject these satisfying arcs and endings, and that subversion emerges as a unifying motif, or whether that's a consequence of the messy and mostly terrible plot. Because The Lord of the Rings has a relatively happy ending, there is room for that story to be told. Tolkien coined the term catastrophe," a sudden turn of good, and he thought it was part of what made fairy stories so special. But not everyone gets that unexpected joy and relief. In The Lord of the Rings, depending how you view the events in Mount Doom, the catastrophe is, or occurs as a result of, Gollum's death. catastrophe is, somewhat by definition, for the heroes. So a story that stared at that concept in a reflective way could be really interesting. A fairy story with that metatextual twist. Here are all these characters who will suffer or die in the margins while heroes get remembered. Nobody cares about Gwendol, who harnessed powerful, dangerous magic to keep his home safe. When he goes missing, they write him off as dead immediately. Legolas will become the hero of Mirkwood. Nobody cares about Mel, who lost her sight in the taming of the Haze and was thrown into the dungeon, where she might have stayed for decades had it not been for Gollum's intervention. And of course, nobody really cares about Gollum, who was abandoned by Mel the moment he needed her most. Gollum's rapidly approaching death will prompt a sigh of relief from our heroes, who, with the exception of Frodo, quickly move on to continue their lives. If it was doing it on purpose and it cut out, like, 60 to 80 percent of the awful side stuff and horrible gameplay sections spent about a month or so on bug fixes actually it probably takes longer i don't know maybe tweak a line or two from this big guy it reminds me of a sponge only if one dies and then shipped the game for 20 dollars instead of 60 or 70 we might actually have something weird and experimental and worth talking about there's also my two golems theory that I alluded to at the start of the video, that this was meant to be a part one, because of how much it went out of its way to mirror the approximately 10 chapters per part of Tolkien's novels. But much like the Queen of Mystery, Agatha Christie, I've been withholding a key piece of evidence until my grand reveal here at the end. In the game's final act, Gollum and Mel acquire the ability to speak through water. There doesn't appear to be a distance limit either. In fact, we get a scene in Chapter 9 where he can talk to her from the Elven Palace while she's beyond the Haze and Mirkwood. Mel is the most important original character this game introduces and survives no matter what the player does. So Gollum Part 2 could have featured Gollum wandering Moria, thinking he's alone, before finding a way to communicate with her. The back half of Fellowship, when he's following the company, they're almost always right next to the Anduin River so he's always by the water. In the two towers, there'd be the dead marshes, the forbidden pool, miscellaneous mountain puddles. The possibilities are theoretically endless. Maybe the tragedy they were setting up was that Smeagol's near redemption in the pages of the Lord of the Rings that we referenced was still spurred by Mel, that all this time they'd kept up an unorthodox friendship, that she pushed him to fight back against his lesser demons. Meanwhile, we'd have those cuts back to Mordor, the mouth of Sauron and the Candleman's daughter plotting to get their revenge. Or maybe the non-Gollum sequel would have continued this general story. The two towers and the Return of the King are split this way, with the first book in each one covering the story of the non-ring-bearing fellowship, and the second books covering the continuing journeys of Frodo and Sam. So telling a unified story that picks up these threads, even if Gollum isn't a POV character, would be consistent with the way Tolkien's told stories in this universe before. Does this hypothetical Gollum 2 sound like a decent game? Not particularly. Would it do anything to redeem this mess? Not really. But I think it answers too many of our obvious questions to not at least mention. Fortunately for all of us, one Gollum is all we have, and it's more than any of us want and more than most of us deserve. There's not a lot of nice things to say about Gollum, little to redeem it except that, you know, it might have been started with good intentions. I guess we could say, it really makes you feel like Gollum. Except no, I can't even end on that overdone joke because it really doesn't. It's miserable and boring, but you don't feel wretched, you don't feel corrupted, you don't feel torn, dangerous, undeserving of acceptance, and unworthy of pity's kindly touch. In its current form, Gollum is just 
bloated and bland without really reaching for anything, which for me is kind of the worst thing that art can be. And I say in its current form because I feel like there is a story under all of this that might have been fine were it more tightly focused. My first draft of this was significantly more negative because I had recently subjected myself to 12 hours of Gollum, and every wrathful keystroke brought me closer to delicious revenge to dunking on this horrible game that I bought and played because I thought it would make for a funny 45 minute video before I geared up for AC2. But the more time I just spent thinking about Gollum's story, the more unfair it felt to hold it up as historically bad. If someone cut out all of the awful gameplay sections and we just looked at the story, it's bad, but it's not significantly worse than, I don't know, half the recent stories we've gotten from what is literally the largest media company in the world. Or we could even compare it to the other recent Lord of the Rings property that came out that most of you probably forgot about, Amazon's billion dollar albatross, whose impact on the zeitgeist seemed mostly limited to confused conversations about how expensive it was for such a middling end product. So yes, Gollum is dull and unimaginative and doesn't really seem like it has a story to tell. That's a lot of things these days, but between the performance and the pricing, nobody's gonna forgive it anytime soon. Gollum doesn't deserve our forgiveness, but perhaps it at least deserves some measure of pity. Yes, Mr. Frodo. It's over now. <laughs>